A very good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this 164th edition of the Together for Education webinars brought to you by Notebook. Just about two years ago, on 20th of April, 2020, when the pandemic has set in and schools had closed down, we at Notebook felt it was our duty to set up a platform that educators could connect meaningfully on, discussing problems like new methods of online education, schools closing down, health measures and protocols, and arrive at common solutions. At that point, we had anticipated maybe it'll be 10 or 12 webinars lasting for maybe a couple of months. Little did we know that today, two years later, 164 episodes later, I'd be welcoming all of you to this session again. In this duration of almost two years, we have been able to connect with more than 120,000 educators across India and even globally. The success of this particular initiative, the Together for Education webinars, has inspired us to move to bigger things and to set up the zero hour inter-school debate where we saw 64 schools from seven countries. The Ignite Inter-School Entrepreneurship Contest where we again saw more than 60 schools from seven countries. It is to your love and support that we attribute the success of this initiative. And for that, we must thank you from the bottom of our hearts. We have discussed a myriad range of topics during these sessions. We have discussed extremely curricular topics like NEP assessments, preparation. We have discussed co-curricular topics like sports, like the house system, like school clubs. We have discussed even school finance and also topics like mental health. Today, we discuss something that a lot of school leaders are grappling with. How do you ensure that the great work that you as a school leader have done while in school does not end when maybe you move from that position? Do you have a chain of command under you who are waiting to take over? In most large corporates, succession planning is a well-formatted thing that the HR takes care of. In schools, however, there are so many other aspects to it. And today we look at this particular aspect of being a school leader. How do you plan for your succession? Our first speaker on this topic is Mr. Philip Barrett. Mr. Barrett retired as the deputy headmaster from the illustrious Dune School in Dehradun after 44 years of serving in education across various institutions. Mr. Barrett served the Dune School as housemaster, head of department, dean of activities, dean of student welfare, deputy headmaster, second master, and acting headmaster with great distinction. He also carried out a visioning exercise for the Dune School in the year 2011 through an in-depth study of a number of British public schools and various schools in the US. Mr. Barrett qualified as a leadership trainer at Wellington College UK in the year 2000. He's also an athlete, an adventurer, and a naturalist. And we at Notebook are privileged to have Mr. Barrett as our senior advisor. Sir, thank you so much for sparing your time to be here today. Over to you. Thank you very much, Abayu. I hope I'm audible. Perfectly, sir. Uh, yes, uh, a wonderful um, um, topic, uh, very offbeat, uh, and will give me a chance to to, uh, to talk about how heads are selected in schools. Um, very good evening to everyone at Notebook in Calcutta, um, our esteemed panelists and our guests. So, you know, there was a cartoon in the last school I worked in at the Dune School, and the, the cartoon had the, um, the, all the heads, all the headmasters of our school uh, sitting, in a, sitting in a row, each and passing a small slip from one to the other. And the, of course, the caption read, um, passing the buck. Each one, of course, passing on the buck, very much like a relay squad. Um, you know, each one that, doing his job the best he can and then hands over to the, to, his, to the next principal or headmaster. And we've had 13 headmasters and the school is 87 years old. So each one, if you work it out, has served the school for about six to seven years on average. Uh, schools do need teachers. They also need administrators. Now, in my view, not all good teachers make good heads of schools. I've seen great teachers make awful heads. And I've seen very poor classroom teachers make excellent heads. There are two very different skills involved. And often we mix them up. Um, both are very important. And both have you know, to be you know, done well for a school to function. Um, I think that teachers are trained to deliver lessons and train children and administrators 
their strength is something else. It is to organize, to have vision, and to see where the school is heading and to forge the path ahead. Um, yet both these qualities may be sometimes embodied in one person. And there's some legendary heads. Uh, and what comes to mind is, you know, Arnold of rugby and A.S. Neal of Summerhill and Boyden of a school called Deerfield Academy, where he served the school for 66 years. Uh, I'm sure there are many legendary Indian heads, heads of schools who've been immortalized uh, through their years of service. Now, the trouble is that in our BED and other trainings that we do, there is nothing to train a person to be head of school. Yes, we had a paper called School Administration and Organization. I remember doing that. But I don't think that gets us ready to be a head of school. I, I wish we could have had an MBA specifically for teachers uh, and uh, you know who want to be school leaders. Uh, it would be great if the IIMs offered a specific course for budding school leaders. The only training that we have to be heads of schools is what we imbibe and pick up within the school systems. If we keep our eyes and ears open and we are keen, we learn from others. We learn as an apprenticeship from other people and we hone our skills. The other thing, of course, is the desire to be a leader and to have that ability to, to have vision and to lead people. I think in India, what happens is that there seems to be a natural progression from being a junior teacher to becoming a senior teacher. And then we gravitate to head a small school. And then we move on to bigger schools in the course of time. And the major driving force in this movement, I'm afraid, tends to be financial. There's much more money and much more power uh, and much more amenities and perquisites when, when you're ahead. Also, you do have the ability and the power to bring about more changes as a head of school, which you didn't have as a normal teacher. And as a head of school, you can change things. You can breathe your value system and leadership style and influence a lot of people, not only children. You can really influence a lot of adults who then look up to you. There are two models I've seen in schools uh, in India. Of course, one of course is where the principal stays for a term, say four to five years. And um, the other one is where there is no retirement age and a principal can carry on um, till he's able. And I have even seen schools where the principal is 80 plus and he's doing a good job and he's, got full, he's full of energy, he's sharp-minded. Uh, in fact, I don't see why 60 should be a retirement age for any, anyone, let alone a principal. I think at 60, your best years are still to come. Now, in most schools that I worked in, um, there have been growth avenues uh, in the school by virtue of an ability we rise up in, a higher, in the hierarchy. Um, I often saw uh, senior teachers in schools um, being made heads of schools in other schools. Uh, but it, it's very, very rarely so that a senior teacher within a school becomes a head. It's generally uh, the head is imported from another school. I feel because the management thinks that you know, familiarity would breed contempt and someone who is homegrown would not be accepted by everyone. Everyone knows what he did as a young teacher. There are stories, there are skeletons in the cupboard, whatever you want. Teachers, of course, should believe that they, sh they can head the school they work in. Um, a teacher who becomes a principal from within a school staff has much less settling in time. He or she knows the workings of the school. They have seen the schools from by rising through the ranks. Uh, of course, they may have prejudices and bias and, uh, and all that. So there are advantages and disadvantages of rising from the ranks and becoming head of your own school. Now, I know at the Doon School, what happened was every five to eight years, the principal changed because they were the term um, up to the age of 60 when a principal retired. And uh, the principal was chosen because of a certain vision that the school was heading towards. If there was need for discipline in the school, well, the principal chosen was a disciplinarian. If there was need to up the academics, the principal was an academic. At one time, I know the school was not doing well financially. So we got an old boy who was never in education. He was a corporate man, but he came in and did so much for the financial um, the coffers of the school. Um, there are times when we wanted international uh, education coming into the Doon. 
So we got headmasters from abroad. We had foreigners who had done IB and other trainings. Um, so, and, and the search for a head at Doon begins years before the present headmaster even leaves. Uh, we have this company called Heinrich and Struggles who, who search for a head four to five years before the headmaster leaves. And of course, then there's a series of interviews and a series, you know, uh, and, and of course they, they whittle this uh, short list down till they fall upon the most suitable person that leaves the school into the next uh, five years. Um, I think what needs to be addressed is the school's ability to grow good leaders. Uh, how much of our headships, uh, how many of our principals are actually looking at young teachers to be groomed? And I'm sure most schools have that very sharp and very astute mind uh, who's a junior teacher, but there is so much potential in that teacher that that teacher needs to be groomed uh, to be head one day. Um, I think the qualities that one must look for is energy, vision, and a servant leadership, which means vulnerability, humility, and empathy. I've also seen teachers who've uh, moved on to heads of schools who have not moved on to head of school because they're happy being where they are. They love being where they are. They don't want to move because a teacher's life, which is what he or she came for, is very difficult, different from a head's life. A head of a school uh, doesn't have much of a so private life. There is social and political commitments. And sometimes a teacher might be able to run a school, but he doesn't want to run a school because he doesn't want the life, the busy life and the stresses of a head. Now, some schools, and I know my, my last school was very famous at this, it is very good at producing leaders for other schools. And at one time, I know a lot of top legacy boarding schools were run by people who were heads or teachers at the Doon School. At least they were departmental heads or heads of uh, or housemasters. Um, I think it's um, you know, as housemaster or a dean or a head of department uh, where one is left free to take one's initiative or take risks, he grows into a leader. Slowly but sh surely, he is groomed and he grows into a leader. And then he can take over the leadership of another school. I think it's important Uh, it is not good for, I, I think schools need to also move teachers around from one department to the other, not subject departments, but give them different responsibilities. Because um, if you don't move teachers from one place to the other, there tends to be a stagnation of ideas and the lack of growth. The other thing that happens is that there's empire building that goes on. A teacher says, my area is more important than yours. There's infighting, there's envy, there's jealousy. And a lot of empire building leads to stagnation. You don't want to give up things. It is important for people to give up their responsibilities to other younger people and groom them into leadership and then take on something new yourself. I think good leadership must ask itself the question, if the head and the senior management are all out of school for some reason, will the school run smoothly? Will we, the staff who are left back in school, will we be able to shoulder the burdens of running a school, even if it takes a week. And I think most schools will answer yes. There are people in the school who can run a school even if the top five people left the school for something, for some reason or the other. I think looking around, there seems to be a lack of good leadership, you know, creative, forward-looking, fair, supportive school leaders in our country. Um, we just put the most senior person to run the, sh to run the show. It doesn't work that way. Um, while we talk a lot about curriculum, teacher training, facilities, I think good leadership is paramount to turn a school from good to great. And we don't do much work on leadership. Um, I want to say that in my few visits abroad, when I visited schools and done you know, surveys, not many senior teachers want to be heads of, to the head of school. They earn a good salary. They've got their own homes. They've chosen an academic path. They might have written some books. They, they are experts at their subject. And they don't want to get involved with the burdens of financial control, teacher recruitment, fundraising, board meetings, 
traveling to meet alumni, legal cases, handling lawsuits. It is that added stress uh, that people shy, shy away from. And yet there are heads who, who, uh, who, who love that stress, who love that challenge. And I must say that being a head of a residential school is a very different ball game to a head of a day school. Each one has its own problems, its own pressures and stresses. They deal with different clientele. We deal with, the problems are different. And a good uh, uh, head of a boarding school may not make a good head of a day school and vice versa. Now, I also feel that no longer being a head of the school is what I remember my headmaster doing. He had the time to watch us run and watch us play. He, he could go around and you know, ruffle our hair. Today's heads are hardly seen. There are most of the time out of school, raising funds and meeting old boys and you know, more old girls and doing other things. Um, I think it's important that we understand that today's heads are different. And um, I want to close now um, with, with, a, with another slogan um, that I saw outside a head's office. Um, it says, the buck stops with me, but we share the bucks. And I think that's a wonderful uh, uh, adage to live by. So I take the responsibility. The head, the buck stops with the head. He takes the responsibility. But when something good happens and we have to, uh, and we get uh, rewarded for it, he shares the buck. So everybody is, is, is praised and, and, and rewarded for what happens uh, good in the school. And with that, I thank you all for listening. I hope I have made some sense on school succession. I look, look forward to hearing from Achin and from our esteemed panelists. Thank you very much, Shubhayu. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, clearly, with your years of experience at various schools and particularly holding so many positions of responsibility at the Dune School itself, we knew we could count on you for some great inputs. And so what a start you've given us. Uh, the point about servant leadership, I'm sure, would be a recurrent theme that will come across throughout the course of today's webinar. Thank you. Thank you so much for this. Our next speaker, ladies and gentlemen, is Ochin Bhattacharya. Ochin is the founder and CEO at Notebook. A chartered accountant by training, Ochin was a director at Deloitte prior to starting Notebook. He has worked in India and abroad in various senior capacities in GE, PwC, KPMG, and Deloitte. He is a fellow of the ICAI and a member of CPA Australia and CPA Ireland. He is also the recipient of the prestigious Indian Achievers Award. An avid reader and a passionate traveler, Ochin has keen interests in economics, history, literature, and philosophy. He is a regular speaker at various forums and chambers of commerce, and also contributes articles to numerous publications regularly. He is also on the board of some of the most renowned corporates and contributes significantly to their brand strategies. Ochin, over to you. Good evening, everyone. Should I am audible? Yeah, Ochin, loud and clear. I once again welcome all of you to today's session. There's a very, fam very familiar adage that we all remember. We all know. Failing to plan is planning to fail. I think this is a very powerful reminder that like any other important project, a successful search for a head of school begins with a very well thought out plan. Now, when it comes to something like uh, succession planning, as we are all aware, that initially it began in the corporate and business world as a more, more reactive process of job replacement. Traditionally, it has been viewed as a, as a top-down process with very little input from employees. This letter evolved with, with passage of time to, to developing the skills of a pool of individuals for future positions within the company. Now, again, replacement planning was a form of risk management, the way corporates looked at it. Managers began to recognize that the continued survival of the organization dependent on the availability of the right person to fill the right job at the right time. So more, more recently, if you see that there's been a huge shift, it's a, it's a seismic shift 
assessment planning has now become a more proactive process. Earlier it was more reactive, now it is far more proactive, which takes a more long-term view. It may be, it may be if we look at it, you know, and uh, try to bring all the elements together, we may define it as a deliberate and systematic effort made by an organization to A, identify, B, develop, and C, retain individuals. I think that is very important. With a range of leadership competencies who are capable of implementing uh, the current or future goals of the organization. Now, if you look at all the elements, identification, so important, developing them, nurturing them, and being able to retain them. Equally important. Now, in today's world, it recognizes that people, and then again, we, we, we live with the practical reality and we, we all recognize that people will change employers and careers several times in their working life. They may change, of course. There are exceptions, but today if you look at current trends, the probability of change is far more. Now, that is the reason initially when we were discussing, we were discussing about nurturing or grooming a group of individuals, a team of individuals. Because now individuals are also, also viewed in the context of the leadership team. There is, a, there, is a, there is a longer term strategic planning focus. Future leaders are prepared by, by, by developing a pool of people. And now this pool of, pool of people might have a range of leadership competencies. I think Bharatsa made a very beautiful, wonderful point that depending on the need of the hour, depending on what the institution needs, whether that be uh, at times more focused on the academic side, more focused on financial management, or, or more focused on rigors and discipline, they got the right person for the job. So developing a group of people with a range of leadership competencies is so important to ensure that we have options. So the focus is on future requirements and providing high potential and high performing individuals with, with, with developmental experiences. And also, I think the role of an institution cannot be ignored in terms of nurturing them, giving them opportunities, ensuring that you know, they, they, they get the right opportunities to take the institution forward, to carry the mantle, to carry the legacy forward. Now, organizations also need to ensure that their human resource practices support the recruitment. And not only recruitment, but also development and retention of appropriate leadership personalities. Otherwise, what happens is that uh, you, you, you go on creating Wonderful individuals who are all pushed by competition. Very unfortunate situation, right? So equally important that we are able to retain them or else it becomes a bottomless pit. Now, thus effective you know, succession planning is far more, is much more than replacement planning. That's only one way, a very, very myopic way of looking at it. A more broader way or, or a more holistic way to look at it is that it has to be based on a great principles, provide a breadth of experiences. It's absolutely critical to leadership. And there has to be involvement of all levels of the organization in different ways. Now, effective succession planning, again, the other, other very important aspect is the vision and mission of the, mission of the organization. That needs to be very clear, especially, especially midterm vision short-term immediate needs, mid-term and long-term vision. So as to ensure that we are very clear with regard to the demands of the job. What exactly do we need at this hour? Right kind of skill set mapping, getting potential future leaders, and being able to also ensure that their, their individual aspirations are taken care of. At times, there might be great individuals with wonderful skill sets, but they might have a different kind of aspiration, different thoughts, different beliefs. And they may do great elsewhere. 
So it's really important that we are very clear with regard to the vision, what the vision is in terms of taking the organization forward. And again, as we discussed, that there can be multiple paths to leadership. And that is the reason it's very important to, to, to not have to groom a group of individuals. So currently, the way uh, succession planning is looked at around the world, be it the corporate world, you know, it provides for a development of future leaders and the ongoing development and retention of current leaders. Because then again, there, is, there has been this perpetual debate inside of us, outside, and that will always come in. And, and it has its own pros and cons on both sides, right? Now, strategic, strategic succession planning, when we discuss, it, it actually provides opportunities for current leaders to develop capabilities and, and assess new challenges. And, and of course, it encourages leaders to, to really step up, step up to the challenge uh, to, uh, and to respond to the needs of the hour. But then again, uh, I think the other very important aspect we were discussing about insider versus outsider, and I guess both has its own pros and cons. Of course, in, insiders, people who have been with the organization, and I'm not discussing about schools, and this discussion is, is general, applicable to any organization, any institution. People who have been with the organization, of course, at times, they're, they're, they're more uh, well-equipped in terms of understanding the DNA of the organization. They understand the work culture. They understand the challenges and opportunities. They understand how things work. But on the other side, they might be too much in sync with the system. They might have got used to flaws that an outsider will easily identify and very objectively try to correct without getting, you know, without getting biased. Hence, there are arguments on both sides. The other thing is that something like succession planning, if it is completely left to individuals to manage, you know, at times the way it, it used to work in organizations, in corporates, we have always seen legends, founders, people who have built institutions of great repute, they should themselves identify their success. And we have, and we have also seen uh, many of such instances going horribly wrong, even in the corporate world, we, all, we are all aware about such examples. Now, the thing is that the challenge is if it is completely left to individuals, if it is completely left to one individual to identify his or her successor, at times the challenge is that they tend to groom, they tend to groom successors who resemble them, who resemble them in, in all possible ways, resemble them in terms of of the social background that they come from, in terms of values, in terms of the kind of uh, appearance, family background. So what ultimately happens is this, this practice perpetuates the glass ceiling and other forms of discrimination. Because honestly speaking, everybody should get a, should get a fair chance. It should be an even playing platform for everyone. So if it is left to one individual, there are chances that the individual may exactly try to try to choose somebody who is more like him or her. But on the other hand, if this entire process is formalized, proper proper human resource structure, completely formalized, then all all employees, all team members who who are at that particular level will have access to the development and training plans. Everybody will get a fair chance. And again, I'm not discussing about schools in particular. I'm discussing about, in general, any organization. And of course, there will get an opportunity to discuss their individual career path, opportunity for better training, and opportunity to at least get a shot at the top, you know, top job. That's all fair. So the human resource planning becomes far more comprehensive. The other aspect is, uh, now if you look at strategic succession planning, it includes uh, policies and processes for, for, for uh, recruitment. We discussed now development and retention of now, equally important that we're able to retain good people. But again, if you look at each of these individually, each of these buckets individually, there's a lot to discuss. I think Bart's already made some wonderful points. And I'm sure uh, we, have, we have a very experienced and eminent panel here today, educators with decades of experience. We're all leaders. 
eminent leaders, and I'm sure they'll come up with their own thought process on this, practical examples. But I believe that recruitment is, uh, it, it involves more than just the selection process. Because uh, the recruitment aspects of succession planning also need to include processes and policies to attract the highest quality of applicants. Because around the world today, if we see around the world, and this is a problem that the entire world is grappling with, that recruitment and retention of quality teachers is a huge challenge. Shortage of teachers is something that you will see around the world. Teachers who are really passionate about the job, teachers who are teachers by, by choice and not by chance, teachers who are not coming to teaching profession because, you know, because... Uh, they're merely getting their job. But teachers who actually want to teach, teachers who are passionate, teachers who dream about teaching. And this is a challenge that you know, is, is uniform around the world, any, any country you look at. And if there's a shortage of passionate teachers, I believe at some point of time, it is going to lead to shortage of potential future educational leaders as well. Because these teachers, few decades down the line, they are the people who will actually be able to manage academic institutions of excellence. So I think that is one, one challenge, which of course, uh, you know, is, is something as a society we all need to think. That the kind of important role that educators play in shaping of our society, in shaping of our tomorrow, we all need to think with regard to aspirations of our children. So a study in succession planning, ideally, if you look at the steps, most important, defining the planning, defining succession planning. A very clear understanding with regard to what we want. And also identify and document the future goals of school organization. It can't be all in, you know, uh, uh, complete hearsay or completely sketchy. It has to be very defined, objective, preferably captured in a document with, with, with bullet points. And this is exactly what we need. And after having completed the first two tasks, the organization needs to base future planning and evaluate the effectiveness of future program. So there are many other things. things. For example, uh, the attractiveness of the job. We were discussing about insider versus outsider. If you really want to attract quality talent, quality talent from outside, because today schools are practically, and why schools, any organization at the end of the day is competing with, his, with, with, with its peers for quality talent. So is the job attractive enough? If it's in a remote location, what are the what are, what are the you know benefits? Why will somebody really be passionate about it? What are the challenges? And when we, when we discuss about uh, whether the job is attractive or not, we are not only discussing about the financial aspect of it. Of course, it is very important, but equally important is in the the other aspect. What kind of freedom and flexibility the leader gets in terms of implementing his or her vision? I think that also is very important. And again, the other aspect which I wanted to discuss, of course, you know, we have discussed about recruitment, we have discussed about development, how to, how to nurture, how to attract you know, uh, quality applicants. We have discussed about the job design uh, with regard to how to communicate and how to handle prospective applicants. But I think the other very important aspects I think a very, very important aspect. Today, if you look at school leaders in India, I think in many occasions, I see, and, and, and this is commendable, if, if you go by the numbers in our webinar, if you go by our interaction with, with school leaders, we see, and I think this, is, this phenomena is uh, global. We see in many instances, we see women doing wonderful job as, as school leaders, as visionaries. Those who have shaped up in shaped institutions with their vision, with their thought process, with their discipline. But the other aspect is today, if you look at uh, the practical challenges, in many instances, in many cases, women are also the primary caregivers for their own children. And if you look at past decades, if you look at our earlier generations in the past, many of them who were very talented, who could have done very good in terms of their career, had to put their career ambitions, and this is very unfortunate, on hold until their children developed a degree of independence. Now, 
it appears however that women at times are on a triple blind at the stage that their children reach an age of independence their parents or their spouses parents require care and again again in many families they are the, they are generally the primary caregiver for for aging parents as well now at this stage many of them might be in a dilemma and may ask themselves that is it really worth because they are in the final years of their career and they may they may end up asking this question that is it really worth for us to take the take, take the extra headache of taking a promotion and being at a, in a senior leadership role for the last few years of of my career but i guess you know what is really important is that as a society and and time has come for all stakeholders to think about this and especially after covid we have seen and this trend is uniform this trend is for all industries this trend is global we are seeing people with part time leadership positions also doing wonderful in terms of their strategic inputs we are doing people being and and i think women who are being able to balance their work and you know balance their work life thing taking care of their families as well as doing a wonderful job they need to be applauded and supported by each and every member of the civil society and this is a cause that i very strongly feel for so this this traditional thought process of you know we need to recruit somebody who can uh, who can give completely full time into the job has no other moderation i think this needs to change taking care of and, and taking extra responsibilities i think is a wonderful thing that only goes on to show how balanced the individual is it only goes on to show that that particular individual if, if given an opportunity can do wonders for us so i think uh, these are few thoughts that i uh, wanted to share uh, Bharat sir, give us a great opening start with somebody of his stature and eminence, with decades of experience in, in managing uh, institutions of uh, global repute. He has given us a very excellent practical perspective. I tried to bring in uh, some of uh, you know my thought process into it, uh, and more from uh, more from I'll say a, a outsider's take on it. But we have a wonderful uh, panel here today, panel of uh, very senior educators with decades of experience. And I really look forward to their deliberation on this very important topic. I thank all of you for giving me a patient hearing. Over to you, Shivai. Thank you, Ochin. Thank you for that wonderful presentation. Well, ladies and gentlemen, as Ochin mentioned, we have a wonderful panel lined up for you. But before we introduce the panel, a little bit about us here at Notebook. We at Notebook are an edtech organization. We create short videos that pertain to the school curriculum. This means that every topic from every chapter of your school syllabus, you would find pertaining videos on the notebook platform. Now, these videos come in handy in two cases. One is when you as a teacher are starting out a new topic. You can use these videos as a method of visually introducing the topic to your students. Whether you're taking the class online or offline, these videos can be shown to the students for a brief six to 10 minutes before the class and have them get a more visual understanding a visual grasp of the topics that you're about to follow. Next, when the students are studying at home, they have access to these same videos on their personal devices, be it a laptop or a smartphone. They can go over these videos again and again until they understand the topic fully. What I'll do now is play a small mashup of some notebook videos so that you know exactly what I'm talking about. Namaste, Bacho. Notebook mein aapka swagat hai. इस नए वीडियो को आपके सामने प्रस्तुत करते हुए हमें बेहद खुशी हो रही है हमारा उद्देश्य है परंपरागत शिक्षा को आधुनिक तरीके से पेश करना ताकि हमारी ये नई पीढ़ी या आप सभी कहीं भी कभी भी इसे आसानी से पढ़ सकें। हेलो स्टूडेंट्स टुडे वी आर गोइंग टू स्टडी द स्टोरी मैडम राइड्स दी बस रिटर्न बाय वाली द किंग Louis the 16th had come to power in 1774 at only 20 years of age. The king helped the 13 American colonies gain independence from Britain. Curly brown hair turning permanently black. If you memorize this line, it will help you remember the ratios all your life. How? Let's see. Some people have is a way of remembering sign is equal to perpendicular by hypotenuse right energy for everything you do throughout the day next is the nucleus the brain of the cell 
This is where all the secrets are stored. Why do you think you have black eyes as your parents? Aha! Thank the nucleus. Whoa! What is this? We are gonna drown. Don't worry, you are not going to drown. This is the cytoplasm. Sometimes, a fully grown individual such as hydra or planaria or starfish can give rise to a complete individual from its body parts. Isn't this interesting? नोटबुक में आप सभी का पुनः स्वागत है Well, ladies and gentlemen, that was a short mashup of some notebook videos. If you head over to our website, www.notebook.school, or one of our mobile apps for Android or iOS, you would find more than 10,000 such videos at your disposal. Unfortunately, the numbers that you saw on the screen are a little dated. Today, as we speak, we have served more than 25 lakh students across the country and some abroad. Namaste, but Well, it is now my privilege to introduce the wonderful panel that we have lined up for you today. We have with us today, Mrs. Hema Maheshwar Sontake. Ma'am holds an MA in English, a B.Ed, an M.Phil, an MA in Education, alongside a diploma in School Management, and she has submitted her PhD thesis as well. She has been a secondary teacher and a secondary supervisor at St. John's High School in Jalna, and a secondary teacher at St. Mary's High School, Jalna. She was a lecturer in Srimati DMM Jalna for two years. She has also been at the Podar International School Jalna as TGT for four years. She was a vice principal at RJ International School Deulgaon Raja District Buldana from 2012 to 2013 and has been the principal at Rishi Vidya Educational School Jalna since 2013. Her interests include creative writing, reading, composing poetry, writing skits, one-act plays, and monologues. Ma'am, thank you so much for sparing the time to be here today. We also have with us Mrs. Varsha SK. She's been, she herself holds a BSc from Osmania University, Hyderabad, alongside a B.Ed., an MSc., an M.Phil., an M.Ed., and an M.P.M. from Pune University in Pune. She was a research associate for three years at the Indian Institute of Education, and for 13 years, she has been the headmistress of ST's Singhard City School in Pune. She is a member of the Board of Studies, Maharashtra State Open School Mandal in Pune. And for the last five years, she has been the principal at JSPM Signet Public School and Junior College, Pune. She has also been principal at the Mansukh Bhai Kothari National School, Kondwa, Pune, for the last two and a half years. She has co-authored a book, Indian Society and Principles of Education, published by Nirali Prakashan. She also developed self-learning modules for primary teachers of PMC Pune. She designed teacher education curriculum for ECC and designed and written curriculum books and SLM for Maharashtra State Open Schools. She was awarded the International Dimension in School by British Council London, the Indian top CBSE school parameter-wise school number one in holistic development by education today, for excellence in STEAM education, fifth Edulator summit by ICSI and Think Unique, the Future Glory School 2020 five-star rated school, a Teacher's Par Excellence Award 2019, the Principal Par Excellence Award 2019, the Best Principal Award by District Sports Office Pune, Valuable Contribution in Educational Development in School and College Award by Bharat Ratna Maulana Azad Social, Educational and Sports Association, Excellence Award 2016-17 by Silver Zone Performance, an Excellence Award 2017-18, again by Silver Zone Performance. Um, thank you so much for making time to be here today. It's a privilege to have you. We also have with us today, Mrs. Ruma Malhotra, who is the principal of the Him Jyoti School in Dehradun. With 16 years of experience in the education industry, not only does she have a taste of the ethos of holistic development of children, but also of management, content development, and branding. She has been a voracious learner herself, and holds degrees in science, biochemistry, and education. She grabs every learning opportunity that comes her way and makes a conscious effort to expand her horizons every day. She's currently serving, as I mentioned, as the principal of Him Jyoti School, which is a very special school serving the underprivileged girls 
of the hills and remote areas of Uttarakhand. Ma'am, thank you so much for making time for the panel today. We look forward to hearing from you. I shall now stop my screen share and put on my video. I'll request the three panelists to please switch on your videos as well. Once again, a very good evening and a welcome to the panel. Hey, ma'am, ma if we may come to you first. Uh, ma'am, the first question, today we are talking about succession planning. As Baritza mentioned earlier, it is something that is not very commonly heard of in school webinars, let's say. Uh, does your organization as a school, do you already have a process in place for succession planning in particular? Hey, ma'am, ma are you there? Hello. Yes, ma'am. Good evening. Good evening, sir. Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for giving me a chance to me to speak here. Yes, sir. In fact, in our school, it is succession is the concept process. Now, when we start, think about succession, there are two things. Like the teachers, they were serving the institution since a long time. They have dedicated their work since a long time as a teacher. And both really are such quality and the institution feel that they can be educated. For them, some special training, some opportunities are provided. And through all these opportunities, the activities, the programs, then it comes to know that whether they are really library or uh, like we can completely uh, rely on them as needed. In our school also, there are uh, same things like I'm the principal and the founder principal of the school. And uh, then vice principal, Mr. Yashwan also sir. Then there are fiction coordinators, there are HODs. And through this chain, then we found that really we can give them some certain opportunities uh, to work. Then uh, there are certain uh, like qualities which we check. For example, it is not decided by me or the management that this person should be leader or he can be selected. First of all, we observe and we check and we see whether the person has certain qualities. For example, whether he takes initiative, whether his nature is ready for the risk, whether it is his desire from within to be a leader, because leaders cannot be made, just cannot be made. He can be supplemented, but that leadership should be there from within. So it is checked that whether he is dedicated to the work, whether he is ready to give sufficient time for the work, and of course the leader is the bridge between students and teachers, between management and the teachers, between the two, the teachers and the parents. So whether he can uh, fill this gap, can he be the bridge? In fact, the person should be passionate. He should select the person he himself individually should select it. He should take it by choice, not by chance, as it was earlier also said. What is his vision? The most important point, what is his vision? Is his vision passionate for his own individual growth or the team? Or the institution should be kept in the center and then his vision, his own passion revolves around. What is at the center is very important. Whether he himself individual is at the center and the person was, or the institution is in the center, and then of course in the institution grows and our passions grow individually we also grow. Important is the importance is given to the person, his institution is at the center, and his passion of course revolves around. Last important point is he should be a very good person who has the team spirit. He should be the best member of the team, then only he can lead the team. And he should have the nature of inclusiveness. He should include, he should be inclusive to um, take all the all the type of people from all the strata, society, the whatsoever, because this is an educational institution. Sir, what I feel, these are the things which uh, we follow in our school for the succession. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. I'm sure the very holistic view that you've taken to this uh, role and how you would go about finding the next school leader is of great importance. Uh, and it's great to know that your school already has that thought process 
on how to select future leaders. Uh, Varsha, ma'am, if I may come to you next, ma'am, we want to know what kind of policies or processes you have in your school when it comes to succession planning. Uh, ma'am, you have to unmute yourself, please. Good evening, all on the panelists, Mr. Barret and Mr. Bhattacharya. Uh, it was a wonderful listening to Mr. Barret and uh, Mr. Bhattacharya. Mr. Barret has given, has, uh, you know, like uh, one course like MBA in school education. And Mr. Bhattacharya has rightly given the charter of the curriculum there, what it should have. It was wonderful listening to them. And I congratulate Notebook for taking up this subject because I haven't heard this subject on any of the platforms in last two years. Probably I'm a little ignorant, might be, but uh, this is really a very interesting uh, topic you have addressed. You have asked uh, whether succession planning is there in our school or not. Actually, if you say the answer is between yes and no, okay. If you say how, I would like to then elaborate. If, with your permission. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, see, when the, if you see the structure of the school, uh, there's a principal, there's a vice principal, we have coordinators and headmistresses. Uh, these people are appointed and we have this post keeping in mind that in future, like when principal superannuous or moves on, the vice principal or the headmistress should take over. Okay. It is assumed. Okay. And I think here we go wrong. What is required uh, for succession planning is the policy, uh, which is uh, chalked out. Uh, explicitly uh, keeping in mind the demands of the post. Okay. And uh, then working out accordingly. Till date, I have seen the school management um, principal, including principal and the school management, the succession is um, addressed in harshest manner behind the closed doors. And there is a time now uh, we need to come out and uh, uh, have a clear policy about it, about who will succeed. And uh, Mr. Barrett had very rightly pointed out, I was listening to him very keenly, and he said, if along with the principal and four to five members of the school, if they are uh, not available for four to five days, will the school run? Yes, school will run. But when we talk about the leader, it is not about running the school. When we talk about the leader, it's about creating a work ethos, the culture of the school, adhering to the mission, completing a, a, like, I, a, not completing, but I would say uh, realizing the vision, it's about that. So it's not only running about the school, I would like to uh, say here. So yes, succession planning is between yes and no. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, in fact, uh, succession planning is fairly new to the corporate world as well. Uh, people initially had hiccups of telling somebody that, listen, at some point, you're not going to hold this role anymore. So figure out who's going to come next. And it was not an yes. easy question to have. But uh, today it's become part and parcel. And uh, I would reason... like to, sorry to interrupt you. I was yeah. recently reading one doc about, uh, I think it was from UAE, wherein, you know, it was about the government, governance of the school. And in that document, they had clearly, um, explicitly mentioned about the succession planning. And uh, they don't only talk about succession planning, but they have also gone a step further and where is they are saying that uh, the document says that there should be financial uh, budget allocation also. Uh, so that the future um, is this my connectivity or uh, did we lose connectivity with Varsha ma'am yeah I think we have lost connectivity with her uh, just let's wait so in the meantime let me come across to you 
Varsham, I'm sorry, we lost your feed for a minute there. Oh, oh. Till till what point could you uh, hear me? Ma'am, we are talking about a budget being allocated for succession planning. Yes. So in that document, they are also talking about the budget allocation to train and groom the successor. So that was really nice reading that, and uh, uh, you really have to plan so meticulously so that the school runs the the way it it has to run, and uh, the vision and the mission is realized. Yeah. Over to you. Thank you, Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, Ruma, ma'am, if I may come to you next. Uh, first question, obviously, do you already have a process in place? And the second, because you lead a very special school, the one that deals with underprivileged children. Uh, after, ma'am, checking if you have a policy, we would also like to know your thoughts about how you see quality teachers coming to this particular institution. Good evening, everyone. First of all, let me thank uh, Notebook and Bharat Sir especially for inviting me on this panel. It's a privilege to be among such experienced people and uh, hearing everyone speak before me, it is an eye-opener kind of thing. And the topic which the Notebook has chosen for this discussion, this is like you rightly said, this is something new on the block. This is not something which organizations and institutions are comfortable talking about. In fact, one of the most difficult discussions for both board members and the principals is succession planning. Because boards avoid the subject because they worry that the principal will be offended, that the board is considering replacing him or her. Principals avoid the subject because uh, they worry that the board might think that the principal is <laughs> willing to leave. It gives a message that probably I'm, uh, you know, dropping subtle hints that I'm leaving. But then let's be very practical. Uh, this is the need of the R. The most uh, tricky or sticky situation an institution can be in is when a principal decides to leave suddenly due to personal reasons or, or for any other reason. So a policy like Varsha Ma'am said needs to be in place. It is. It is the need of the R. Now, like you said, do we have a policy? No, currently we don't have a policy, but uh, thanks to Notebook, and if such panel discussions happen more frequently, we will be, our eyes will be open to this topic also. Though it is happening in a very, um, I would say not explicit manner, but in each school, we do identify teachers who are prone to uh, take the lead when the principal is not on the seat. But then it should be more structured, it should be more planned, it should identify with the ethos and mission of the school. One should know exactly what one is looking for. Uh, Mr. Barrett had mentioned it is not uh, necessary that a experienced or senior teacher can take the role or a very highly qualified person can take the role. There's so many, so many factors which come into play when we are talking about who's going to occupy this all important seat, which will carry the uh, institution forward. Talking about myself, when I joined this uh, very special institute, I uh, told the teachers that take every opportunity as uh, a way to prove yourself. It should not be taken as an additional burden that, uh, okay, fine, if this opportunity has been given to me, what will be the remuneration? What will be the special responsibility allowance uh, associated with this responsibility, but build your resume. I was not a born principal. I've been a teacher all my life. I got this opportunity because uh, there's not a thing which I have not done in my, uh, in the entire career, which was, I was just a teacher, but being a teacher, I donned several hats at different points of time. So when we talk about succession planning, we need to identify teachers who are proactive, now this is, again, succession planning is not a reactive, should not be a reactive thing. It should be a proactive thing. One should, the, as an institution, one should start thinking about it, that who is going to take the seat. So uh, identification is on for teachers who are proactive, who are passionate, who have a, who can look at things with a 360 degree eye. That is important for this role. Uh, and obviously, one who can identify with the school ethos, one should, first of all, we as policymakers should identify where are we headed to? What is the goal? Are we going to strengthen the system which are already existing? Or are we going to take a leap forward? I, I think my the previous panelists have covered almost everything which I wanted to say. And I was nodding that what will I say when my turn comes? But basically, this is what I strongly believe in, that... Uh, 
every teacher is capable of it we need to empower them we need to give them opportunities we need to tell them that they are capable of it and uh, unless and until opportunities are given it will not be possible so we should move ahead about this very important topic which you have taken today with a very positive outlook that succession planning has to happen and the board and the uh, principal should be in tandem with it the outgoing principal should be asked advice there should be a hand holding happening so that uh, otherwise which is the uh, uh, who is going to suffer ultimately the organization is going to suffer so one question which everyone should ask is what is in the best interest of the organization and then take a decision any decision which is taken with this in mind what is best for my children if i am a principal i know it's my children it's my school so whoever follows me should be able to take the school to greater heights thank you i i think uh, uh, this is what i wanted to share thank you thank you so much ma'am and it was great listening to it uh, in fact when i first asked the question that do you already have a process in place for succession planning uh, we kind of knew that the answers with most schools have is no and uh, i think all of you have said that this is perhaps the first time you're coming across this topic very interesting topic yeah <laughs> thank you ma'am uh this is our thought process ma'am uh, when we looked at school systems two years back right and today when we are looking at the school system has been an incredible story of our schools navigating through perhaps the most treacherous times that they would ever face now in doing so you have done what most corporates would term as transformation right most corporates would hire maybe a deloitte and a bcg and spend millions of dollars to undergo a transformation that schools have done organically all by dint of their principals and teachers stepping up over the last two years so what we at notebook are trying to do here is have schools look at themselves as a well managed well oiled corporate machinery as well where processes like succession planning hiring leadership development come into your regular foray of the job right i believe if there are not enough teachers coming in and saying not enough talented people coming in and saying we want to be teachers it's both a demand side as a supply side problem and if schools start behaving and acting like large corporates do there's no reason why it would not attract the best talent in the country uh thank you so much for your views ma'am varsha ma'am i'll come back to you uh now understanding that there is not too much of structured succession planning that is going on as ruma ma'am said there's already some amount of grooming that is happening right there are young teachers joining you who are perhaps starting their career paths as teachers in that case what are those qualities that you look for in identifying that saying that okay this person is a future leader like ruma ma'am said 360 degree vision is one thing that she is looking for what would be your top things to look for see what i feel here is that uh, the purpose should be clear even if uh, i see some young teacher uh, who is capable of uh, leading a school or the person herself feels that yes she wants to uh, become a leader school leader the purpose has to be clear okay because that is the reason of the journey and the second thing is the person should be passionate about the school education because that is the fire which is going to light the way these two things are very important clarity of purpose and passion about the school education if this two things are in place then of course uh, see the journey from a young leader to the principal like in our times when we started two decades ago it was long and laborious okay and uh, um, two decades ago the role of technology was also i don't want to be little the role of technology but uh, um, uh, there wasn't much around two decades ago but today if you see the young teachers they are tech savvy they are uh, smart and uh, the only thing what i miss in today's time is how many minutes are you giving mr roy about it because i'm going to broach a subject which is very sensitive i'll take uh, two two minutes two to three minutes go for it ma'am we don't have a limit yeah. on this oh thank you so much um so this uh, i would go back to recruitment of teachers now because in last a uh, one ticket we have been seeing the gradual deterioration in the quality of teachers and this is being spoken in 
uh, most of the platforms we principals are facing this issue the school management is worried about it so what is the reason if you see the reasons they are um, uh, government policies of opening too many teacher education colleges uh, without uh, um, contemplating on demand and supply and now there are more colleges than the teachers required than rather i would say young generation who want to join teaching profession then these colleges how would they survive how would they sustain so they give admission to the uh, student and uh, um, sorry to say but the way we were educated when we were doing our uh, teacher education course ba then mn Uh, it was quite rigorous and we were fortunate to have amazing teacher educators who have groomed us now this young teacher comes for the interview you ask them about uh, bloom's taxonomy she has taken an examination just a fortnight ago and there is a big question mark on her face who is mr bloom like and then principal job is uh, we have to see some basic skills like communication skills subject test is being taken and then principal is uh, loaded with you know grooming of this young teacher wherein the principal teaches them the various teaching methodologies and uh, various pedagogical interventions either i either it is a principal or in few schools if they have teacher training the cell that cell does it now coming to our question that what trait do we see uh, in these young teachers to become to lead the school to become a leader i think they need uh, they need to be voracious reader be it kindle or a book hard copy they have to be voracious readers that is something no uh, uh, leader can uh, compromise with and they must have inclination towards academics and along with other they they have to be team players because ultimately it's a team game running a school and taking care of administration is uh, completely a team game the young leader must be loyal towards the school's vision and mission many a time schools teachers do not know what is the mission of the school they must know what is the mission of the school and they should be loyal towards it and of course uh, the uh, young leader should be flexible and experimental and uh, there are certain positive uh, personal attributes which the person should exhibit and should have because that what uh, i think that grooms the school that creates the culture of the school and of course the teacher that young leader must be patriot because ultimately that is the important trait because uh, it uh, it is very important for the character and culture of the school ultimately we have to give to the community to the society and nation at large so the leader has to be patriot this is what this is my personal opinion of course is open for discussion thank you thank you so much ma'am for uh, listing those out uh, before i go to the next speaker my apologies if my connection goes off but the power over here has been going on and off so oh. uh, you'll have to kind of excuse me on that uh, ruma ma'am if i may come back to you ma'am you already spoken about the qualities that you're looking for uh, now to again touch upon another sensitive topic do you think schools should ideally recruit from outside or do you think grooming somebody from within the system would actually work better i feel grooming someone from within the system will work better because then there is discontent at why is someone always para dropped from outside i mean no matter what we do uh, sometimes this thinking sets in that uh, it's uh, it's worthwhile to resign leave join another organization come back with a higher salary slip show the value show the market value and then come back again so this is not this is not right so if there is a deserving person inside the organization uh, i think mr barrett said that there will be no settling problems there will no teething problems the person already knows the organization the ins and out the ethos the uh, there so many things which are not said 
uh, and only a teacher who has been with an organization for many years understands the, these nuances. So why not? Why not give the opportunity to those who are deserving? Pros and cons definitely are there. Familiarity breeds contempt. There can be prejudices, like uh, one of the previous speakers said. But uh, we need to find out a balance. Otherwise, the, uh, whosoever feels that he is deserving will be left with no option than to resign, join another organization, prove their market value, prove their worth, and then come back again. Ma'am, but what about when you choose somebody internally and in a group of, let's say, N number of teachers that you have, it's always going to be N minus one people who don't get chosen. How do you handle that dissatisfaction? By making the point that hard work always pays. You also work hard. <laughs> See, the, the appraisal, the uh, assessment should be a, a very transparent process. There should be, the teacher should be given the opportunity to self-assess themselves, then there should be HOE or peer assessment, and then the principal should be talking to the person in the office, in the presence of the HOD, where the strengths and the weaknesses are pointed out and the teacher is agreeable to that. If teacher has something to say that, no, fine, what you are saying about my weaknesses is not correct. So it should be given a chance to justify. And it should be a completely transparent process. Suppose I feel I am worthy. So I should be able to prove that to my organization, to my uh, management, that why I am worthy. And if the management thinks otherwise, the management should be able to say that to me. So if a person is chosen above me, or uh, like you said, there's so many and only one person will get the chance. So it should be out in the open. And that will act as a motivating factor for the others that if she can do it, so can we. We all started together. We all started at the same level. If if one can do it, we can also do that. And think big and so you become. That's the message which everyone should be getting. If one of them is promoted, I mean, I think that's going to change the culture of the school. Otherwise, everyone will be dormant. Everyone will know that this is the point. It, it is a static position. There are no chances of growth. If a promotion opportunity is there, someone is going to come from outside and rule over us, which I don't feel is uh, a good policy. Wonderful, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Hey, ma'am, ma if I may come to you with the same question. Uh, ma'am, are you there? Yes, ma'am. Uh, an insider versus outsider, as Ochin mentioned earlier, is a perpetual debate when it comes to leadership choices. Uh, what's What would be your approach? I think that it should be within. It should be from the school itself. There are many aspects like uh, from individual side of the person also and from the institution. If you think from the institution, it is like the person who has given so many years, who has given his uh, lot many things to the school, who has, who uh, really is aware of all the very small minor things of the school, who knows what is the requirement of the school, who knows what are the challenges in front of the school? Who knows what where now the school is standing? From what background it has grown, it has developed, and to what level it has to take. These all things this person knows. See <coughs> the individual, it is like uh, the justice done with the uh, employee, the person who has given his uh, lot in years. He also should get something from the school, from the institution. So I think it is the proper justice given to the institution as the person who knows the school can run it in a better way. And uh, it takes less time, suppose a new person who is liable, who is really um, uh, worthy to become principal or the head of the school. But it will take some time for him to understand the school. That time period also can be minimized by the person from the team. So I think that uh, the person from the school itself she should be chosen for this person. That's all. Am I audible, sir? Ma'am? Yes, ma'am. I'm quite sure you are. It's my network which is going up and down. Sorry about that. Uh, Ruma, if I may come to you, uh, I'm sorry, I missed last couple of sentences from ma'am. Uh, 
but if I'm not repeating a question, ma'am, uh, we are now talking about, let's say, a year, two years from now, schools do plan to have uh, succession planning as a valid process. What would be the process by which you would groom somebody, right? If you've identified the person, if you have kind of known that this is going to be the next leader, what would be the grooming process like? We are lucky to be in a day and age of workshops. If one wants to learn something, there is no dearth of the uh, resources available. One should there should be a willing learner on one side, no dearth of resources. So by making the teacher participate in various workshops, uh, I mean I feel there is so much out there to learn, to read, to uh, empowering the teacher. I would empower my teacher. I would see whether, uh, you know, by delegating, by uh, giving responsibilities, when uh, these are the qualities which I am looking for, the qualities which, uh, which I want to uh, see in the future principal. So I'll be giving the teacher ample opportunities to prove that. And that's how I'm going to groom. And you, you learn. See, uh, the, it's a day of uh, organic learning. Every day is a learning process. I'm sitting on my chair. I'm learning every day. So uh, a steep learning curve will be given to all the teachers and those who outshine get the job. Ultimately. Wonderful. Wonderful view, ma'am. Uh, Hima, ma'am, I'll come back to you again. Ma'am, uh, as I said, if you already have the process, what would be your method of grooming? I'm sure you have a structure of principal, there are vice principals, and then there are coordinators and teachers. Uh, at what stage would you want to start this? In fact, it depends. Like, uh, shouldering the responsibility should be the first step. Succession, uh, many a times in my school, it starts unknowingly also. For example, when the responsibilities are given, it is assigned that time, what is the outcome? How the person works? His way of working, because it is not only the ultimate result that this uh, responsibility is given to him, and we have got the result. Not only the result, only one person also can get the result many times. But when we are looking forward to that person as a leader, then the way he works, that also should be observed. Whether he is taking the whole thing with him, whether he is also uh, training under him, say some other people, so his complete process. Is under, uh, under observation, and then we come to know when we get the result that ultimately we got the result, we got the success. But the way the process to which it went that is also important. So, I think that shouldering many responsibilities, inspecting things, observing, and uh, the whole process under us will uh, show us will give us the result and the next procedure. What we have. Thank you, thank you, ma'am, for that. Uh, Varsha ma'am, I'll come to you with the same question. Uh, in terms of process, when do we start and what do we do with our future leaders? Hey, the question about when do we start is, uh, I think grooming should start uh, once the uh, candidate is identified, you know, that is yes, so-and-so person is a probable candidate. Of course, as I have already shared with you, most of the schools, or rather all the schools, they have the system of uh, having supervisors or coordinators and headmistresses, vice principals. So uh, once the probable candidate is or candidates are uh, shortlisted, if you say the, how, uh, the grooming aspect or how they should be trained, uh, we can break into uh, various uh, uh, domains like uh, a domain related to only students and then teachers, the school administration, management and parents. And uh, I think the resource management, finances, then there are uh, uh, um, like conflict resolution, something which principals you know, are always doing on day-to-day -day basis, negotiations. How, how does this skill help? How to negotiate? Even the uh, principal has to negotiate with the students, the fellow teachers, the parents, the school management is a, uh, a, sk a skill worth honing. So I think these are the some, these are few aspects of uh, grooming. Mr. Bhattacharya has you know, spoken about, I, as I was saying, 
he has given almost a charter of curriculum of what mr brett has said about the mbn school education so uh, yes grooming is um, it can start and it's not only uh, hands on there are some uh, as i said so the person has to be voracious reader and then some hands on uh, uh, experiences like whatever like these are the areas where principal is active you know day in day out so the the next candidate the successor can also be given a uh, few cases to handle on her own with a complete trust of course the principal has a back but then the school management uh, um, personnel also can have their back and make sure that she is uh, doing well during her training tenure so i think these are the things uh, how the person can be groomed wonderful ma'am thank you thank you so much for that uh, unfortunately we are close to the end of our time uh, and i would now want to wrap up first of all a huge thank you to all of you for sparing the time for this discussion uh, we knew that this was not a topic that you would typically come across in an education webinar or conference anywhere but we felt it was important that it be addressed given that there's a new shape that our schools our education institutes are taking uh, some of the key learnings that we have taken away today Uh, we are looking for people with an attitude for learning uh, as bharat sir said up front servant leadership is in, enormously in, uh, important in that particular role and we're looking for people who want to be team players and who align themselves and are loyal to the entire school's mission and vision and as varsha ma'am earlier pointed out unless you're a patriot there's little you can do in this country in any particular role uh, my particular takeaway today is if we were having this webinar with let's say the ceos of a google a facebook and an apple or a coke and a sebi and a deloitte it could not have gone any differently from what it went today the leaders that we have in our school are running enterprises that are as important as forward looking and as transformational as any large fortune 500 corporates that we have in the world and we doff our hats to all you teachers all you school leaders for giving us the future country that we deserve to live in uh once again thank you so much for your time bharat sir thank you so much for that wonderful wonderful opening and uh, to each and every one of you who participated and you know patiently listened throughout the webinar thank you so much for sparing your time with us not only today for the last two years actually we look forward to having you again soon for our next session until then please take care stay safe and goodbye thank you sir bye thank you sir thank you it was a pleasure to be here thank you pleasure is all thank you so much thank you Thank you. Thanks, uh, Gitali. Could you please close?